Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. In this video, we will talk about the working principles of Hall Effect Speed Sensor. Now there are different types of speed sensors ranging from optical sensors to Doppler radars and I'm sure there are more types. But in this video, we will dive into Hall Effect Speed Sensors. So let's get into it. Now sometimes you'll notice these modules attached to the axle of the view and there is really no way to know if these are optical or Hall Effect Speed Sensors unless you open them. And once you open these up, one of the main characteristics of Hall Effect Speed Sensors is the presence of this wheel with gear teeth on it and this probe here, which is also sometimes referred to as pickup coil. Sometimes, however, the Hall Effect Speed Sensor might not be placed on the outside and instead might be placed on the inside for different reasons. So one of the reasons could be something like you have a disc brake present outside on the axle and because of this disc brake there is really no space here. So in that case the speed sensor might be placed on the inside. Let's look at the 3D model of the bogey. Now in first scenario we saw that the speed sensor was placed on the outside on the axle somewhere here and here but in the second scenario we saw that the speed sensors were placed inside. So in that case the gear teeth and the pickup might need to be positioned somewhere on the remaining parts of the axle, such as here, 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 or here. Now let's look at the origins of this Hall Effect speed sensor. As the name suggests, this phenomena called Hall Effect was discovered by the scientist Edwin Herbert Hall. What he observed was if there's a current passing through a conductor or a semiconductor. In this scenario, the electrons are flowing from negative terminal of the battery to the positive terminal and the conventional flow of current will be the opposite, so from positive terminal to negative terminal. So he saw that in this scenario, if there is a magnetic field that is passed through this conductor or semiconductor, then the electrons experience a pull towards one direction. In the previous case, the electrons are flowing straight, but in this second scenario, the electrons are pulled towards the upper direction. And if we were to measure, then you would see a potential difference between the two sides of the sensor because now there is more concentration of electrons on one side versus the second side. And this can be attributed to something called Lorentz force, which was derived by the scientist Hendrik Lorentz. And he basically said that if you were to place your palm in such a way that your fingers are pointing in the direction of magnetic field and your thumb is pointing in the direction of current, then those charged particles will experience a force in this direction. So applying the right hand rule to the experiment, you can see that if your fingers are pointing from North Pole to South Pole and your thumb is pointing in the flow of current, which is from this direction to this direction, then the charged particles will be experiencing a force in the upper direction. And again, if you were to measure, you will see that there is a potential difference. This was the experiment that was performed by Hall and he noticed this phenomena. The actual experiment though was performed on gold foil, but for the purpose of this discussion, we'll just mention conductors and semiconductors. Conductors. Let's look at the applications of this, which is the Hall effect speed sensors that we use in railways. Take a permanent magnet and that will have these imaginary field lines coming out of it. And if you remember the discussions from the axle counter video, these lines are representations of magnetic influence or magnetic field. They start from North Pole to South Pole and they seek path of least resistance. Because of this property, if the field lines were to be something like this in the open space, if I were to now bring a ferromagnetic material in between, then the field lines will concentrate and pass through that material because that material is now path of least resistance for them. Going back to our original setup, this is the magnet with imaginary magnetic field lines. And if I were to bring a ferromagnetic material, the field lines will concentrate and go through the ferromagnetic material. Let's place this conductor or semiconductor, which we'll also call the Hall effect sensor on the magnet. Right now you have field lines which are spread out and going in all directions. But if I were to now bring a ferromagnetic material, these field lines will now concentrate and go through that material because it is now the path of least resistance for them. So like the original Hall experiment, if I were to connect a battery and now you have electrons flowing through this Hall effect sensor, that the electrons will now experience a force because of which they will be pulled in that direction. Now one of the key qualities of this sensor is high electron mobility because you want a material that allows electrons to move freely. Because of that freedom, the electrons are able to display from their natural path. In the presence of ferromagnetic material, the field lines will now concentrate, meaning 
the field will be stronger, meaning this B will go up. Because of that, these electrons are now experiencing a higher force. So in the previous scenario, they are experiencing some force, and in the next scenario, they are experiencing higher force. So the displacement is low and high, low and high. And that basically forms the essence of Hall's speed sensor in that now if we were measuring the potential difference between the two sides of the sensor, you'll see that the potential difference is of a certain value and then it is higher now and then it is lower and then it is higher and then it is lower and higher. If we were to measure the potential difference, it's of some value, then it's higher, then it's lower, then it's higher. Now extending that concept, instead of having that ferromagnetic box, now we have a ferromagnetic wheel. And as the wheel rotates, you have the magnetic field lines that are constantly getting more concentrated and less concentrated, which then gives rise to this potential difference being measured through the sensor. As you can see, this air gap also has a lot of influence on the potential difference, which we'll discuss later on in this video. So a more realistic representation of what I was showing you before would look something like this, that you have a wheel with gear tooth, and all of this setup on here is condensed into small probes that are then placed against the gear wheel. And instead of permanent magnet, you could also have a solenoid. So, so far what we saw were pulses of uniform width, but in reality, the width of the pulses constantly changes based on the speed of the wheel. So as the wheel speeds up, the pulses become smaller and smaller, and rightfully so, because now you have more teeth passing through the probe per unit time. So let's look at this experiment above. You'll see that as this speeds up, the pulses become smaller and smaller. And that's how it happens in real Hall effect sensors. So let's look at some high level calculations. If the diameter of the view is D, then the distance traveled in one re revolution would be pi into D. And let's assume the number of T's in the gear T's is N. Then the distance traveled for every single tooth or for every single pulse would be pi into D divided by N. Now at any time, if the frequency received from the sensor is F, that would mean that there are f number of pulses per second. And if there are f number of pulses per second, that means the distance traveled would be the distance traveled per tooth multiplied by the number of pulses or number of teeth per second. And what is speed? Speed is distance traveled per unit time. And that's exactly what this is which is distance traveled per second. So in summary, the wheel rotates, and when wheel rotates, the gear tooth assembly rotates, and when that rotates, it gives rise to changing magnetic fields, and when the magnetic fields change, it gives rise to changing pulses, and when the pulses change, that results in calculation of speed that is then displayed on the HMI. So, so far what we discussed was single speed sensor, which can be used to calculate speed. But if we used two speed sensors, now that can be used to calculate speed as well as direction. So let's look at this here. In case of a single speed sensor, you have pulses being generated like this. In case of two speed sensors, you have now pulses being generated like this. And if we were to combine that information, we can see that now if the signal A switches first and B switches second, that means that the wheel is rotating in clockwise direction. Same way if this pulse is leading, meaning the B pulse is leading and then A is following, that means the wheel is now rotating in this direction. So now with two channels, we can also know the direction as well as the speed. In reality, the two channels look something like this, that you only have one sensor, but now you have two sensors. One thing to note, if I were to go back, is that the spacing between A and B has to match the spacing between these gear tooth, because if B were to be slightly on the left and right on top of the teeth, the waveforms would not look like this, and you would not be able to know the direction. So that means only a specific type of wheel can go with the two channels, and you cannot use, just use any wheel. So to demonstrate my point, I have taken screenshots from a publicly available data sheets of one of the Hall effect speed sensors. And on that data sheet, you can see there are clear requirements for the target wheel. So the material has to be ferromagnetic steel. You cannot use any material. And the tooth form has to be a specific form. Here it mentioned that it should be as per DIN 867. If you were to open the DIN 867 standard, it will show you different tooth forms. And these forms are referred by module numbers. You can see it says module M, 1, 1.25, blah, blah, blah. This is how the modules look like. So 
the speed sensor is actually only compatible with gear teeth that conform to this module from the BIN standard. The width is also specific. You cannot have a very thin gear teeth and there are also requirements for air gap. Here it mentions that for every module number or for every gear teeth form, this is the permissible air gap and this is the nominal air, air gap. And if the air gap were to be more than this, then the signal would be too weak to make anything out of it. That was all about holistic speed sensors. I hope to see you in the next one. Thank you.